Today is Tuesday, September the 25th, and this is The Drill. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and uh, this is Ron, your host, the only true conservative in the United States of America, because I'm the only one that makes the presumption for the status quo. <clears throat> the um, Kavanaugh hearings, now there is a second accuser, and now talk of a third accuser. <clears throat> This is what happens. This is the likely, uh, this is the consequence, not likely, but the uh, absolute consequence of what I was describing before, where uh, you ignore, you, you are ignorant of what it is the Democrats and the left are truly after. Uh, they are after metaphysical reality. They are out to force the, the right to prove a negative. And once you've gone ahead and you've accommodated that, as uh, Senator Grassley has done, Senator Grassley being the uh, head of the uh, committee that is uh, overhearing uh, the uh, or confirming, working on confirming um, Judge Kavanaugh. Once they've done that, they open the door to endless other accusations. Even Rush Limbaugh knows this, as you will hear uh, shortly. <clears throat> so, again, if they had get gotten this right from the beginning, understood that what's at stake here is not mere t short-term political gain about whether or not the Republicans will keep the House or the Senate in November. It is about reality itself and whether or not this country is going to acknowledge reality or pretend that reality doesn't exist with all of its uh, consequences. And uh, one of the consequences for the uh, right at this particular time is an endless amount of accusations. Because once you've honored the first arbitrary allegation, there's no reason that you won't honor a second one and a third one. As long as all these allegations are coming um, uh, by women then it becomes a uh, juicy political issue and one in which the Republicans ostensibly cannot uh, resist. But resist they must. Grassley should have and still can stand up and say, this is enough. We're done with this. This is obviously nothing more than a political ploy. Uh, we're not going to honor it uh, unless uh, the um, ladies have uh, corroborating evidence. We're not going to even listen to it. We're going to go ahead and have the vote, and uh, we're going to move on, and then move it to the full Senate. <clears throat> That's what he should have done. That's what he should do now. Because if he doesn't, the longer he keeps going on with this, the more... Uh, w when does he stop it, and on what basis? How does he... Does he say, well, three's, uh, two's company, three's a crowd? Three, three is enough, four, five, where, what is, he's going to have to arbitrarily say, well, that's enough. You're going to get then belly aching from the left saying uh, that everybody should be heard. Everybody has a right to be heard, and the uh, nomination is stalled uh, forever. <clears throat> and not just this nomination, future nominations. The next Donald Trump puts forward, because no matter who, Trump puts forward, the left isn't going to like him. The, Donald Trump could put Thurgood Marshall up for uh, to renominate Thurgood Marshall, although he's passed away a long time ago, but uh, just to demonstrate how the left operates, and they would uh, again try to stall uh, indefinitely his nomination. Doesn't matter who Trump puts forward. So that nomination. Any other uh, Republican president in the future, the precedent has been set. The um, uh, Senate uh, to today and in the future will be expected to abide by this precedent, and you will be giving power to the powerless. And that's another fundamental thing. Politically, uh, the Republicans are in charge. They have the power uh, to get uh, Judge Kavanaugh um, nominated and get him on the Supreme Court. And they're giving it away. And if they're going to do that, then what's the point of voting Republican in the first place?
All right, so when I come back, uh, Rush Limbaugh is going to back me up on this. I'm going to have a, ver- a an audio clip of him doing so. And then after that, it's going to be uh, Ayn Rand's word of the day or concept of the day, uh, followed by, um, uh, let's see, The Death of Right and Wrong by Tammy Bruce and uh, The Black Book of the American Left by David Horowitz. So don't go anywhere. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Welcome back. So um, the the title of this clip is called GOP Must Cur- Confirm Kavanaugh or Kiss the Midterms Goodbye. Chairman Grassley has a job to do here because if he gives Democrats enough time, they'll produce a woman claiming to be Kavanaugh's secret Russian wife who Trump paid to urinate on that bed in Moscow. If Grassley waits long enough, the Democrats will come up with the woman claiming to be Kavanaugh's secret Russian wife. He's a bigamist, too, don't you know? And Trump paid Kavanaugh's second wife to hire a bunch of prostitutes to urinate on the bed Obama slept in while in Moscow. If if Grassley doesn't get a handle on this and just do and I'll tell you something else, which everybody also knows. If the Republicans do not get this vote taken and have Kavanaugh confirmed, you can kiss the the midterms goodbye. You can kiss goodbye holding the House, and you can kiss goodbye holding the Senate. Because whatever the Democrats think of their base, the one thing I know is that if you guys fold on this and cave and keep bending over backwards, you've done that enough. You've demonstrated that you don't hate women. You've demonstrated that you're open minded. You've demonstrated that you want to hear from her. You're never going to hear from her. She's never going to show up. She's not telling a story that can be verified, Senator Grassley. She's not going to show up. If you guys don't conduct this vote in defiance of all this, and if, if, if Avenatti gets one foot in the door to a Senate committee to start telling his story, then you can kind of kiss goodbye Republican chances in the midterms in November. Because people are going to logically say, what good does it do? So there you go. He gets it mostly right. He just doesn't understand. He's like a lot like Donald Trump in this particular example where he's right, but he doesn't know why he's right. He doesn't understand the underlying cultural and psychological uh, foundations uh, for why he's right about this. Uh, now, as far as him making a prediction, and that's part of the problem with making predictions, is that making predictions is avoiding is a way of avoiding making a value statement. That's what the left likes to do. The left uh, refuses to acknowledge reality, and if reality doesn't exist, then you cannot make a value statement. Then it is true that you cannot know things with certainty and that there can be no universal rights and wrongs, and therefore you can't make any value statement. So how are you going to conduct yourself? Well, you make predictions. Well, I predict disaster. If XYZ happens, uh, disaster will follow. If XYZ doesn't happen, disaster will follow. And that's what Rush Limbaugh is doing here. He says, instead of saying, um, Grassley has done the wrong thing, as I said in my monologue. Uh, Grassley was wrong to do what he did, and he should have done something else. And I described what it is that he should do. Uh, Donald Trump instead, who is basically uh, taking a page from the left, uh, why he's doing it, I don't know. I'm perhaps out of convenience or to feel that he's uh, part of the multitude. I don't know. But he is uh, aping the left in making a prediction and avoiding making the value judgment here and predicting that uh, they're going to kiss the midterms goodbye, blah, 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 uh, which is uh, may or may not happen. The real question is, should it happen? Should people turn their backs on the Republican Party? Yes. Your first loyalty is not to the Republican Party or the Democrat Party, for that matter, or any political party. Your first um, re- uh, loyalty is to uh, reality, to uh, being reasonable and rational and all the things that spring from that rationality. So, again, uh, Rush Limbaugh gets it uh, right, but he doesn't know why. So hopefully one of these days he'll figure it out. In the meantime, we're moving on.
And when we come back, it's going to be uh, Ayn Rand's concept of the day. Thank you very much. Let's see where I don't know what this is. Hmm, this is interesting. Let's try that again. Nope. All right. All right, Ayn Rand. So uh, the concept of the day from the Ayn Rand lexicon, today's concept is change. They proclaim that there is no law of identity, that nothing exists but change, and blank out the fact that change presupposes the concepts of, of what changes from what and to what that without the law of identity no such concept as change is possible there you go something to think about and uh, now i was going to take a break but i don't think it's necessary we're going to go into tammy bruce and the death of right and wrong and uh, Tammy Bruce, excellent person to read and listen to because she gets to the heart of the issue. Uh, she gets to the, she doesn't quite get to the philosophy of things, but she does get to the cultural foundations of politics and the political struggles of today. So when we left this, we were working on the uh, four um, cardinal virtues that she was describing. So, and we're at, let me see. Um, let me see here. Hold on. Mm. Let's see. I'm going to go ahead and read this again. I think. Well, I'm no. I'll just go ahead. I think I've I completed that one last time. It was the uh, fortitude, and I think we're on to the church of malignant narcissism. Until recently, most Americans would have agreed that the cardinal virtues are obviously good things to apply in our lives. There's nothing Machiavellian about them. They do not ask for money nor demand. We do without. They are non-judgmental, and if applied in mass, they would, without much personal sacrifice, actually solve most of the world's problems. You don't have to be a Christian, as I am not, to see how this uh, is really about common sense and concern for the future. The religion of the left, however, the Church of Malignant Narcissism, requires the application of the antithesis of these values. The cardinal virtues requires an effort be made beyond ourselves with consideration of others. They require personal responsibility, a healthy frame of mind which takes work, and for some of us, psychotherapy, honesty, and an end to blaming others for everything that goes wrong. By their simple existence, they threaten the very mentality that drives today's left-wing establishment. The question we all face is what sort of culture we will live in for the rest of our lives and then hand on to the next generation, one that embraces these most basic of values or one that collapses because of their absence. In the stories that I will be telling, you will be, you'll see uh, this is exactly the point of the culture war being fought right now as the damaged left elite work to transform our culture into a reflection of its disfigured uh, worldview. And uh, they do so, again, because their ultimate aim, where this is where Tammy Bruce kind of misses the boat, the ultimate aim of the left is uh, worldwide socialist paradise, to have worldwide uh, revolution or perhaps worldwide evolution, because there are evolutionary socialists, and um, and resulting in a socialist paradise, in which case... Um, their, their attitude again is that it doesn't matter if a few people suffer along the way because in the, the ends will justify the means. Then in the end, we will have paradise. Everybody will be happy forever. And so, uh, whoever it is that ended up having to suffer one way or another along the way, um, w- it will be worth it. And, uh, they will be martyrs to the, uh, socialist ends. But, uh, again, she gets it right uh, from the standpoint of um, the values. And I'm glad that she talks, uses the V word and uses values. And uh, the one thing she doesn't uh, quite get to, though, 
is that the values are only possible if one acknowledges reality and um, acknowledges certainty as well. Unless you're certain about things, so you can have no values. There is no such thing. So when I come back, it's going to be the um, uh, Black Book of the American Left with David Horowitz. Thank you very much, and uh, this is Chapter 10 of the uh, Black Book of the American Left by David Horowitz. David Horowitz was a, uh, as he calls himself, a red diaper baby. He grew up in a communist household and was a a lefty, a communist, uh, for a number of years before um, going ahead and changing, coming to uh, an epiphany uh, during, during his association with uh, the Black Panthers, and he became a conservative. And so he's written volumes on uh, the American left and what it was like being part of the American left, how they thought, <clears throat> and uh, their psychology and their culture. So chapter 10, think twice before you bring the war home. And I did want to preface this by saying that uh, in the, this is most of this stuff is things that was happening in the 60s so far in the book. In the 1960s, the Black Panthers and the Vietnam War. And the Vietnam War was huge. I grew up during the 60s and 70s. As a matter of fact, the first 15 years of my life was when you turn on the TV and got the news, you got news, weather, sports, and the Vietnam War every day for 15 years. If you thought that the uh, the war in Afghanistan was long, the war in um, the uh, the war in uh, uh, Iraq. Uh, was long, no. And the, the Vietnam War preceded my birth. I think it started uh, sending advisors or whatnot, I think, in 1955. So, But the point is that uh, when the war finally ended, I was shocked. I figured that the war was going to never end. Because, again, for the first 15 years of my life, news, weather, sports, and the Vietnam War. Think twice before you bring the war home. I am a former anti-war activist who helped organize the first campus demonstration against the war in Vietnam at the University of California, Berkeley in 1962. I appeal to all those young people who participated in anti-war demonstrations on 150 college campuses this week to think again and not join an anti-war effort against America's coming battle with international terrorism. The hindsight of history has shown that our efforts in the 60s to end the war in Vietnam had two practical effects. The first was to prolong the war itself. Every testimony by North Vietnamese generals in the post-war years has affirmed that they knew they could not defeat the United States on the battlefield, and they counted on the division of our people at home to win the war for them. The Viet Cong forces we were fighting in South Vietnam were destroyed in 1968. In other words, most of the war, most of the casualties in the war occurred because the dictatorship of North Vietnam counted on the hope that Americans would give up the battle rather than pay the price necessary to win it. This is what happened. The blood of hundreds of thousands of Vietnamese and tens of thousands of Americans is on the hands of the anti-war activists who prolonged the struggle and gave victory to the communists. The second effect of the war was to surrender South Vietnam to the forces of communism. This resulted in the imposition of a monstrous police state, the murder of hundreds of thousands of innocent South Vietnamese, the incarceration and re-education camps of hundreds of thousands of more, and a quarter century of abject poverty imposed by crackpot Marxist economic plans, which continue to this day. This, too, is the responsibility of the so-called anti-war movement of the 1960s. I say so-called because while many Americans were sincerely troubled by America's war effort, the organizers of this movement were Marxists and radicals who supported a communist victory and an American defeat. Today, the same people and their youthful followers are organizing the campus demonstrations to protest America's effort to defend its citizens against the forces of international terrorism and anti-American hatred, which are responsible for for the September attacks. I know, better than most, the importance of protecting freedom of speech and the right of citizens to dissent. 
I also know, better than most, that there is a difference between honest dissent and malevolent hate between criticism of national policy and sabotage of the nation's defenses. In the 1960s and 1970s, the tolerance of anti-American hatred was so high that the line between dissent and treason was eventually erased. Along with thousands of other leftists, I was the one who crossed the line between dissent and treason. I've written an account of this matter in my autobiography, Radical Son. I did so for what I thought were the noblest of reasons, to advance the cause of social justice and peace. I've lived to see how wrong I was and how much damage we did, especially to those whose cause we claim to embrace, the peasants of Indochina who suffered grievously from our support of the communist enemy. I came to see how precious are the freedoms and opportunities afforded by America to the poorest and most humble of its citizens, and how rare its virtues are in the world at large." If I have one regret from my radical years, it is that this country was too tolerant toward the treason of its enemies within. If patriotic Americans had been more vigilant in the defense of their country, if they had called things by their right names, if they had confronted us with the seriousness of our attacks, they might have caught the attention of those of us who were well-meaning but utterly misguided, and they might have stopped us in our tracks. This appeal is for those of you who are out there today attacking your country full of your own self-righteousness, but who one day might also live to regret what you have done. So again, this is why I love reading David Horowitz. I mean, this is just rich and and thick and chocolatey, and I mean, it's deep, nice and deep. One of the criticisms I have of most pundits today, right-wing pundits, is that they're shallow, incredibly shallow, that everything in life is politics and politics for politics' sake. Bull. Uh, and David uh, Horowitz uh, shows that here in this uh, last chapter. Um, that, uh, again, that, um, w- you know, that a lot of these people were what uh, Lenin referred to as useful idiots. You know, they uh, meant well, or maybe they got involved because they felt pressured to, or because it seemed exciting to get involved in anti war. And uh, get and treasonous efforts, and um, <clears throat> but they didn't really think about it. And he, I think, one of the mo- in most interesting parts of that was where he says uh, that the the rest of the government, rest of the government, and the rest of the people shouldn't put up with it when when the line is being crossed from a dissent to treason. That um, the the rest of the country must come down hard on it. And by doing so, they will discourage, at first, the people that are truly dedicated to the struggle, down for the struggle, true communists and whatnot, probably are not going to be deterred very much. But the useful idiots, the people that are involved in this so-called struggle because they've been um, bullied and intimidated into doing it, are going to think twice. Okay, they're they're the ones that are going to say, you know what? Uh, this is not as much fun as I thought it was going to be. It's really not worth it. And that's the same thing, the advice I'm giving to all conservatives, uh, and not just about anti-war protesters, but when dealing with lefties in general, if you simply stand your ground, you're because mo- most of the time you're dealing, again, with the useful idiots, the people that don't know what they're talking about. Uh, they, they repeat whatever they hear said on The View or from Colbert, or from uh, some other CNN or CNBC talk show host. They don't know what it means. They don't know, have no idea the um, intellectual foundation, or lack thereof, that is supporting their argument. So uh, by simply standing your ground, you're going to find these people are stymied. They don't know what to say. They don't know what to do. And that if enough people, enough conservatives, simply stand their ground and refuse to be intimidated and bullied by these people, they will eventually decide that this is no longer any fun. They will give it up and look for something else. So, that at uh, this time, that brings me to the conclusion of another episode of uh, The Drill and... Until next time, 
I thank you very much for listening to me and have a great day.